this is Mary Nichols from Portland, Oregon. Um, Mary is one of the Vigil TV teams out of Portland and has uh, an outstanding scope of work and story to tell us about that project and many other things. So welcome, Mary, to OPN. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, what we'll do is just launch right into it. And um, I guess if people happen to have questions, just put them in bold in the chat. Um, we didn't put up a pad yet, and so we'll just do that on the fly. And um, if uh, clearly or Zena, if you guys happen to have our um, our production pad open, if you could grab the links when they're appropriate, that would be great. So, Mary, thank you for being here. Why don't you give us a little introduction about yourself and a little bit of background so we have some context to start working with. Sure. My name is Mary Nichols, and I um, got drawn into Occupy when I was uh, when I was holding my sign for 16 days, and in the middle of that, and the sign was for a rally to label genetically modified organisms. So I was standing there when Occupy came through, and it was really exciting. And so at the end of those days, after my rally on the 16th, I was able to go over check out the camp. And I just started going over and over. And I live a little bit away with my husband. So we drove in, and I spent more and more time there. And somewhere around Halloween, I began to self-identify as an occupant. So that's that's my background. Already an activist, but that was uh, new within the, the last uh, four years or so when I was in uh, school for botany, learned about genetic modification, did some research and got horrified and uh, decided to protect organisms rather than just study them. I'll study them later. <laughs> um, so your your previous activism was uh, centered around GMOs and food issues. Is that accurate? Um, and you came yeah. to... So why don't you... Can you tell us what compelled you to, to enter activism? Was it the food thing that really sparked that in you? Yeah, I got drawn in kicking and screaming. I was not ready to be an activist because, uh, you know, you can imagine I was in, you know, science training mm -hmm. and the objectivity is paramount. And so when I began looking at, you know, the issues of what could be happening um, against what the textbook says are certain knowns, like how they are beneficial, feed the world, are perfectly safe. I was horrified to find that in my textbooks, but not find that evidence in my research. So I began to kind of diverge with my professors, except for one. Um, and that put me at odds with the whole idea of science, and it really dragged my heart because I really wanted to be a botanist. Um, so anyway, uh, um, I don't think that the two are opposite. But they certainly were treated as such by my peers at the time that I was going to college. Mm -hmm. So I was a returning student. I waited 20 years to go back. So anyway, yeah, I didn't want to be an activist. I certainly didn't want to turn into a radical. <laughs> this all just happened to me. It's it's just that bad out there. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, thank goodness there's people like you that are willing to take that on because I would I would say just from that comment, you you are. That you're definitely an activist and a reluctant radical, but choosing it by necessity, which speaks well of you because it would right. be easy it's to walk duty. away from that. You start, yeah, joy joy comes with work, and um, it's, it comes from me from a sense of duty, and a lot of people find that unattractive, but I think you have to be in that state of mind, and a lot of us got into that with Occupy, where we just dug our heels in and said we do not accept this and we're not going away until we fix it so that that has become you know all-consuming for my family um, because my husband works and the two of us make one occupant mm -hmm. um, I, I love that you frame it as a sense of, of duty we don't hear that very often and we often ask that question like what compels people and a, I think of sense of duty is such a honorable and humane place to start and it can be what gets you through the difficult times um we're going to talk a, a good bit about the uh 
individual TV, individual project. And so I think before we get too far into that, I want to make sure that we discuss your distinction, which, which I agree with, and we've had these conversations elsewhere, but the distinction between the word homeless and houseless. Right. Um, I was interviewed in the Oregonian newspaper, which was, which was wonderful, in the community section, so you had to be downtown to see that. But um, the, uh, the distinction for me is that, unfortunately, now homeless can be used as a slur for a group of people by people who do not understand that this is not a type of person but a, a housing status alone. And I didn't really understand that myself until I started working at the vigil. And it was something I always suspected since I was a little child that um, there would be, you know, all kinds of people and we wouldn't uh, feel like they deserved what they got or that they couldn't be, you know, in a better situation. And boy, was I right. I've done a lot of interviews of people and talked to, you know, probably up into a thousand people now about it. And it's, it's, mind-boggling how correct that was that no it's not a type of person and it's our negligence of giving up on people and being able to stomach the sight of 2500 people sleeping on the you know the street literally like the sidewalk of Portland mm -hmm. so the, the shelters are way full there's only about a third of that in beds so there's 2500 people left over and they don't have the same story. They're not all mentally ill, they're not all drinking or doing drugs. And, and the, those that are, um, you have to frame it in a different context. It's not recreational drugs. Methamphetamines and heroin and hard liquor are medication in that situation. They're for personal pain that, you know, people have been raped. They, they're for, you know, an abscess tooth. And I know that it sucks people in, but until you have, you know, slept in the snow outside and had people spit on you for it, I don't think uh, a person can judge and call that recreational drinking, you know. So, so even even among the people that are representing those stereotypes, the people who are mentally ill, and that's another example. Schizophrenia is apparently a medical condition and not just a mental illness, but a physical, genetic, you know, uh, and it can be treated. Um, and so to just throw these people away at, in these categories or another, another idea is laziness and that, I don't know, it, it's sick, but, uh, I think a lot of our lack of compassion in our city stems from this idea, which is at the core of why we are, you know, moving away from the word homeless mm -hmm. and homeless, you know, d doesn't have to be a slur if, if people's idea about homelessness wasn't a slur. So, yeah, but that's why I say houseless. It, it struck me as odd when I first heard that because I live in an apartment, so I'm houseless, right, but right. It, it's housingless. Right. Housing. Or shelterless. You know, shelterless or, or, yeah. Um, so, uh, and I will, I will try to adhere as I, as I go through the evening and feel free to correct me when I, when I do misspeak. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on the, um, the population. You mentioned a number 2,500 and is that 2,500 ish, uh, people that are in the street regularly, uh, and, and are there more houseless people that are being able to take advantage of shelters or is that the total population, right. you know, Kind of lay right, that out no, for us. That's just left over on the street. No couch surfers, no people going back and forth. The people who are just on the streets daily on sidewalks. That was estimated as, as the uh, sidewalk management plan, which is the uh, really is the out of sight, out of mind plan, which is what is victimizing so many people. But the sidewalk management plan draft of 2010 estimated 2,500. You'll hear, you know, a lot of people say 2,000, but. Um, right. I'm going with 2,500. Okay, and a little bit of... So that's outside the shelter. The uh, shelter might have a 1,000 people in them. They're full every night. And then you've got probably double that amount of people who have unstable, no housing of their own, you know, and, and having to find a place. And, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Right. Um, just a little bit of prehistory. I was in Portland in the early 80s, and it had a significant homeless population excuse me, houseless population at the time. 
and um, my understanding being young and uninformed was that Portland was a fairly at that time a fairly accommodating city that they had good shelter systems good um, you know food delivery systems and so it was if you had to be houseless it was not a bad community to be in so over time has the population just outgrown the support system or did the support systems no, get reduced? the support system has been killed by the 1%. It's a total conspiracy. This is a money-making machine. Houseless people are an industry, mm -hmm. and you can see how the shelter is. There was a nine-floor shelter that now is one floor, um, the, the, and that's a private place. Um, but they're not getting support. And the, uh, the housing uh, has been torn down the lower income housing. What's gone up is housing that is only okay if you're a drug addict and then they house a bunch of what college students? I don't know, but most of the most of the housing that is supposedly low income is not actually available to people who are living on the street. So they've just torn down a bunch of housing and made you know, and called everything um to see a bunch of U's that uh, on the buildings. I can't remember what that means. It's not condemned, but it's you know, it's not rated to, to be in. Like uninhabitable um, or something like that. Yeah, and and uh, interestingly, those are in really good parts of town that would be <laughs> good uh, value for developers, and it's not a coincidence. Yep. The homelessness went up 30% last year. Oh, my goodness. 30% last so, year. And, and uh, in fact, the 10-year planned and homelessness um, that Portland came out uh it was, uh, I think, a renewal. So we're in the 17th year of our 10-year plan, and houselessness went up 30% last year. So what we're actually doing at, at the vigil, in my opinion, is telling City Hall that they have failed. They need to recognize that, stop making an industry out of it, and start listening to the stakeholders, which are the houseless people themselves and their advocates and organizations. Because uh, we would not be spending... $360,000 per unit of housing for these new shelter, you know, programs. Um, that's incredibly wasteful, and we've got to wonder what kind of corruption is this. Mm -hmm. And the other form of corruption to me is the jail, because it's making room by turning out people who've been sentenced for eight years to, a, you know, to turn them out in a month in order to make way for all the homeless people that they've made criminal just by existing, like through using a blanket or getting on the bus when they've taken away the fairless square. So uh, we're definitely making money in Portland off keeping people off the street. I mean, uh, keeping people on, on the street. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really sickening. It's criminal and morally and ethically corrupt. So I'm, I'm glad to be having this conversation and you're bringing it to light because I think that surprises a lot of people. I also think that if we looked closer in our other larger urban communities, the same thing is happening, that the, the people involved just don't have a voice um, and are, aren't right. getting the attention. So it's something we need to shine the lights on. But Portland really stands out to me. We have the only court that you only go to in the United States if you are homeless. If you can even believe that. It's very specific to the homeless. That, yes. They get their own court. And they basically just stamp them guilty and then they're on their way. And then they go to community service. They put this right in the middle of their supposed shelter. Um, so it's very intimidating to begin with, with all the residents. Um, and they, this is where the services come out of. This was the Bud Clark Build Commons, which cost $47 million but only had 130 units. That's where I'm getting the... the uh, Three hundred and sixty thousand dollars per unit. Um, they, they've they've had a lot of grants. They've had a lot of you know federal dollars. It's missing. You know something is definitely going on. And 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 it's a free labor program. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine making it illegal to sleep anywhere or have a blanket on you in the winter, and then making it illegal even though you're mandated by the state to go to some kind of a program, you depend on city services. You know, we, we encourage all of these tax-paid programs, but then we took away the bus fare. You know, so you can't, you, there's no fareless square. 
So a houseless person cannot get from one place to another unless they spend their entire budget of whatever they got canning. So um, it's, it's an impossible situation. So they're going to jail for 10 days at a time for fair hopping. Um, anyway, they get kicked awake in the middle of the night, you know. Um, so, and, you know, if they sass somebody, not even knowing it's an officer at the time, if they sass them, the, the officer is, is grabbing them harshly, leaving their stuff behind where they lose everything they have. They're losing their spot that they had for the night and then thereafter, you know, and losing their ID. It's just not, you know, their, their belongings don't come back to them. So they're, they're incredibly endangered. And, and the only time that they will stop, the only time that they will not be forced to move from one place to another and allowed to rest is when they're on the outskirts where it's dangerous, you know, crack alley. And um, so that's what we are trying to stop with the camping ban. But the, the reason I brought it up is because you said, okay, Portland's being progressive. Last time you saw, you know, it was, it was known as one of the places to be homeless. And in fact, people in Chicago were laughing and telling people to go there. You know, go to Portland. You know, let's send them all. And I know that I know that our representatives are very afraid of that kind of phenomenon. You know, that that houseless people will come from all over the globe to live in Portland. Um, you know, on the dime of the taxpayer. But uh, but the fact that they made a special court just for houseless people, the most unconstitutional thing I've ever heard of, makes this a civil rights movement. And to me, that's what Occupy is. It's a civil rights movement because the concentration of power, even though it's not a minority of people, it's a minority of power. The 99% are a minority of power. And so it, it really is a, a civil rights movement. And the people to lead it are going to be the most oppressed. And right now I believe that the houseless people in Portland are, are possibly the people who are going to really lift that up. Because there's they're serious motivation. There's a lot of activists among them. Right. Um, and I want to just touch on something that, you kind of you framed it in the context of occupy and houselessness is one issue of of a thousand and that's the one that you focused on but you you mentioned earlier um about your your motivation you want to speak to that now so we don't let that slide yeah down. yeah so so uh, first and foremost i'm an occupant and that's that's why i'm there because um gmo to me is a threat of biology on the scale of well Armageddon and you know that's an entirely different conversation I'd love to have but why biologically I feel that this will end our lives and the world as we know it uh, I put that all aside and stopped working on that because when, once I got to the point where I saw that the House of Representatives Agriculture Committee usurped the USDA and, and they and the FDA who were bought are shoving these things through and there's nothing we can do about it. It made me realize that, that our problem is Citizens United. Our problem is, is that we are guaranteed to have the most corrupt politician because uh, the one who spends the most money on their ads always wins and now they're getting unlimited money only from corporations, not people. So we know that only bought and sold politicians will ever be in those decision-making Abilities, and that is who is driving things like genetic modification in the food system without uh, our right to know. You know, so I'm behind Measure 37 in California to just label them, because then it'll be all over. They'll do a medical study, and they'll be gone. But um, and until until that happened, um, I just felt like, okay, I'm chasing an unwinnable battle at this moment because of the sheer speed of you know degradation. Our our rights you know, constitutional rights, every, everything that's, that's happening to people, we're, we're being victimized so quickly that, you know, we're on our way to just pure fascism without any power. We have to do something so quickly, and that is to cut at the root. And the root to me is, is things like Citizens United that gives us this system. So, yeah, that's, I was really reluctant to be radicalized <laughs> but I, I do believe that the system itself has got to be transformed so much that it's almost unrecognizable right um, but anyway my, my motivation for being at the vigil is to resurrect occupy in a place that to me is the most pure 
that we could, which is helping the most poor, uh, the most vulnerable, the most uh, oppressed in the civil rights movement. Um, because it, it, if we raise people uh, to discover their ability to change the world on something that has been sold to them as unfixable, these politicians have guaranteed that everybody in Portland seems to think that homelessness is so unfixable that we can't, you know, we can't even try, and therefore we don't have to, and therefore we can live with ourselves when we step over people and don't even see them as they're suffering on a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening, you know, that's killing our soul. So just the act of overcoming one battle like that and having people reach in with their compassion and say, okay, if we just don't accept. Let's just start there. We'll figure the rest later, but let's just not accept that houseless people are living on a street. Um, and then we win that battle. By winning that battle, which we can win just by getting houseless people at the table and, and taking over that role of directing the money of where they solve this problem. So it's such an easy, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult to convince politicians to let go and let somebody else do it and cut off their cash cow. But it is easy possibly to get citizens to care enough to make that happen, whether the politicians want to or not, once we end people living on the street by sheer will of the populace, then people, I think, will start to get that, yes, we do indeed have power. And that, to me, is the, the, the number one goal of the Occupy movement, is to take people from a position of believing that they are powerless and trusting everyone else with the responsibility of giving information to them instead of you know, checking it out for themselves. Um, once we change that, then, then we can reverse all of these harms that have been done to us by the 1%. Um, so that's why I'm there. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> it, that was so eloquently stated and summarized, and I, I appreciate <laughs> that. And I'm, I'm glad you brought it all back to Citizens United because I, I said time and time again, that decision alone is just completely, if nothing else, destroyed our democracy and eliminated all possibility of fixing it. But you, you make the point of of still being hopeful and optimistic in the in the face of overwhelming odds, and that if we can get people together and to rise up and first to believe that they can do something, to believe in themselves yeah. and the collective and effort the for media. the common good. Well, yeah. I'm so sick of the media because they're they're corporate and nobody seems to understand that whatever faith that we had. Th the problem is is people have faith based on things that they learned when they were last in education, and what we learned was you know journalism integrity and independence of media, um, the checks and balances in the government, you know, and and so now. Now we have faith in those things, even though the basis of that faith has been undermined. And that faith turns into this fanatic um, desire to squash out other other people's opinions as being, you know, just silly, you know, or crazy. And and that is where MSM wants us, because those are the same companies as with the oil and with the, you know, all the crimes against humanity. Those are the same companies, and just a few of them. So I'm I'm very, you know, disturbed when I see, you know, media which has like a channel for every the same media, the same company will have a channel for you if you believe X, Y, or Z, and the purpose of it is to tell you that you're right about the world and be comfortable knowing that you're right. And people are self-medicating, you know, with their problems to hear on television that they are already right. So it can't be that bad. It's not unpredictable. Everything's fine. You know, con continue shopping. And so, my uh, my desire would be for people to reject mainstream media as it has had the underpinnings. You know, they're they're gone. Everything about independent journalism is gone. Right. And um, in MSN. yeah, I've I've been just on this tirade about uh, alternative media and new media now of which we're all apart for that very reason because you know I, I look at your work and the work that the Vigil TV team is doing 
Those stories would not get out there if you weren't on the ground. I look at Lorenzo and Elizabeth down at Keystone. Nobody would know they're actually building the damn pipeline if it wasn't for new media journalists. You know, you don't, you don't have to look very far to re recognize the importance of that. So I'm glad you, you yeah. brought that point up. It's, um, it's so fundamentally necessary. We have to take back control of our stories and we have to get our narrative out there and we need to think of ways to broaden our distribution, our message, every possible way because reasonable people would find what you see on a daily basis to be unacceptable. And that's what we yeah. need. We need to get that in front of reasonable people. Um, yeah, yeah. And and sometimes we do get an MSM. Like I said, we were in that uh, we were in that paper in the Oregonian, which is a, a terrible rag, but we got in there. And um, you know, we've we've gotten on television on a network, local network as well, with an action that was uh, a, a good piece about us. You know, for the vigil. So, you know, we, we are trying to pick something that is very easy for people to see, you know, see the clarity of what's right and wrong and which side. It's been a challenge because uh, when I go and present what we're doing, I always say Occupy Portland. Mm -hmm. And Occupy Portland has gotten a horrible name just merely on the basis of having um, MSM uh, misreport what is happening with the police and um, that fiasco about saying it was about the park damage, which was non-existent. Um, but having the, the people turn on us means that you have to make a decision. Do I break off from Occupy with my group, or do I, do I call it Occupy and try to change it from the inside as far as perception? And that's the way I've gone. Is I, I am very upset with the people who have taken their group and stopped calling it Occupy Portland, I feel like that, that is exactly the opposite that they should be doing. They should be taking the fact that they're doing good work and adding to that counter voice that says Occupy Portland's okay, you know. Right. But I'm, I'm very disheartened, you know, that, that people have been doing that more and more, and I think that's going on all over the USA. Mm -hmm. So not us. We're Occupy Portland Vigil at City Hall to end the camping ban. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, let's get into some of the details about the vigil. You know, your team, what you're doing, the geography, you know, how how many people are you guys keeping watch over uh, on a on an average right. night? And just kind of give us a snapshot of that, of the work you and the rest of the team are doing. Okay, so, so there's two things going on. There's vigil and there's vigil TV. The vigil to end the camping ban uh, was created by Colonel Moses, Andrea, the general, and um, her mother. And uh, they lit a candle, put some artifacts on, and stuck it on City Hall. And uh, Colonel sat there, you know, and all all the time, and, and so did other people with him, but mostly Colonel. And uh, he just refused to leave until the camping ban was lifted. And the camping ban is where they take the recreational camping law and apply it to houseless people and say that they're a campground by having a blanket. And it's disgusting because, um, you know, Nick Fish, our housing commissioner, said in 2009, um, it's my belief that we should, we need to relax some of the, the camping laws or uh, for people who have no choice but to be outside. And... He has done nothing of the sort. It's, it, they've come down harder and harder on these people um, with blatant targeting. So, so we're trying to get that actually happening. I, I don't need everybody to have a tent every single place, but if we make it illegal for people to be alive, then that is actually the fall of our entire civilization. So anyway, um, so that's the camping ban. That's how it started. Um, it was it was long to get support because having just a few people there every night you would get a bad element sometimes and then uh, Occupy Portland um, didn't support it because they'd come down and see a mess they'd see something they didn't believe was representative and so I started um, hanging out more and more and my goal was to have people change their mind about that and dig in and try to make it a better you know uh, a better representation of Occupy. So that's that same, you know, change from within and be proud of who you are kind of, you know, idea. Mm -hmm. 
And that's exactly what they did. But it took a sexual predator to to begin that um, because I was in danger. There was a guy hanging around there, and uh, it you know he was quote part of Occupy, although he would say he wasn't anytime we asked him to abide by a rule such as nonviolence or whatever. Not that he was violent, he was just dangerous. But um, this uh, this galvanized a group of women feminists and the sexual assault survivors advocates um, to get behind not just, you know, having him out of the movement, you know, not welcome, persona non grata, which is I don't know how many places that's happened, but this was pushed to an extreme. He refused to, you know, to stop his behavior, so it had to be done. But anyway, that, uh, I went and said, look, you guys, if you get rid of a person who's hanging out of the vigil and say they're, they're gone from Occupy, they are going to target me and this vigil and all the, the people there who are coming for safety, which include people who are young, um, so we have to, you know, man this, you know, more. And they they did. And from that moment on, Occupy Portland truly embraced it. They made it official. And it's an interesting thing because it's a prayer vigil. So um, having a, you know, a political activism group say that they have this prayer vigil is it was unusual. I don't. I don't think it could have happened any other way than a group of independents um, starting and doing well, and then, like always in Occupy, you know, after it's kind of off the ground, people get behind it, and then it becomes, you know, part of us. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not like something you just vote in and start doing. It was a long struggle. So after. Uh, I would say it was about January 28th. I started spending every other night there for five months, and without fail, maybe three nights that I missed. But um, that that was the time I was brushing snow off of people with a brush, like a, a broom. It was it was really tough, and I had uh, emotional and physical things that I went through that have given me some trauma, where it, where I will recall it and and begin to you know, feel sick over it. Mm -hmm. Um, the, that, that's when, uh, that's when it got too real. And I started to identify with this community and seeing things, you know, walking in the shoes a little bit, because even though I could go home and so it was a fantasy in a way, it was like a tourist. I could go home and I knew that as long as you know that you can make it end whenever you want to, it's not the same experience, but I had, some very strange mental tricks happened to me from being in this position of um, I took the bus there and I couldn't get home when I wanted to. So when I was stuck and there was this predator just harassing me, because he was more than just that, he was also a, you know, a person who would verbally abuse and, and all sorts of things. And then I had uh, other people who were troubling and I'd be alone down there, you know, sometimes. So, and in fact, one time it was so bad, I came to the office and I was like, "We, I need help. This, this person's going crazy and I can't talk to them. I need the playing field leveled. And one of those people was 99. And that's my co-host on Visual TV now, which started in May uh, in response to my fear that on May Day we would have casualties. And people would come lick their wounds at the vigil, like always. Whenever we get broken up in a march, everybody recenters at City Hall. Mm -hmm. It's become that, you know, that touchstone. And so, um, 99 never left. He was out there all the time, you know. And I don't think he. I think he has better places to be. I think he could live somewhere, you know, or or does. I don't know. But um, he's there all the time, and it's made people feel very safe, you know. So eventually. He was the person that I gave, once I started doing visual TV, uh, I started interviewing houseless people to kind of find out why they were there and, you know, just let them tell their stories. And we started putting together this picture. After that, 99, uh, I gave him the uh, clear hotspot and, he, you know, we got a donated phone for him. And he's an amazing journalist. It, and people just love him. He's the one who engages the audience most. He's very funny. So 
he does a lot more goofing around because he's on the night shift and part of what we do is watch over people which means staying awake so you'll have to you know understand and I know Fuzzy's watching Fuzzy knows this um, we're staying awake to watch over people and vigil TV in the night is mo and sometimes during the day a lot of it is just us amusing ourselves and talking to our viewers. We're doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> there's no interview. There's no content. It's just pure fun, and you know, but it serves that purpose. But then in the morning, the police come, wake everybody up, try to tell us what our rights are not, which they are, and we talk back and we record it. And I've built up a case for a lawsuit because uh, of the uh, attempt to absolutely squash and humiliate and destroy our you know our vigil so and you asked how many people were there it, you know it varies right now there's there's going to be about 10 mm -hmm. um, there were a hundred and we have you know the police in the city to thank for the fact that these refugees were shooed away um, but uh, you know we, we just waited regrouped and you know we have to orient people who get there because if you don't want to have rules this is not the place for you because we have to run kind of a tight ship in order to you know not be shooed away permanently although they're doing it anyway they don't want us there they don't want to see houses people mm -hmm. they think it's messy looking and this is at this all takes place outside of city hall correct mm -hmm. it's the front sidewalk yep. and the public complains because we're messy and we're not messy. It's just that there there'll be muddy tarps or wet sleeping bags from the rain, or um, could be people and they have items with them like backpacks, and they're sitting there and the public thinks that they should keep walking, mm -hmm. and they don't realize that people need to sit down, people need to lie down, um, and that they cannot just put their things in a locker for the day or in their house. So. Um, homelessness does look extremely messy when it's on a sidewalk and that is the problem that's why we're bringing it in front of City Hall because they've gotten so comfortable with it being out in the outskirts that they let it raise 30 percent last year right out so of sight figure, out of mind right exactly yeah I have a I have a chant out of sight out of mind into graves and the band you know that that's what that's what's happening right now right um I, I just, you know, each time we talk or share an email, I'm just astonished at the, the degrees of how bad it really is and how difficult it is for the, for the people. Um, your trajectory in this, um, it sounds, I'm thinking about your time there, the five months straight. You, this is unlike anything you had ever experienced before is is that is that not accurate I, I, and the yeah. reason I ask that question is I want to, to make the point of how this has affected you and how it's changed your vision and your outlook and you you've come to know these people I've watched your interviews you know people trust you I gotta imagine that was earned trust over time um, but we we in looking back and watching some of your stuff in preparation for the show, you know, I also have been able to see a change in you. It, it could not be otherwise. And I was wondering if you're comfortable speaking to that a little bit. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. That, that stuff fascinates me. You know, personal journeys, even though it's my own, it, it, I, it doesn't seem like my own because it's just like, wow, did that happen? Um yeah, I could not have imagined what has been taking place. Um, you know, I, I okay. So, the the big, the big uh, grand finale for me, um, which I don't talk about, but I think it's, it's it's interesting, is that all of these things about how to be an activist seem to me to be the um, the Bible mentions, you know, Jesus teachings and I didn't really have a big connection there so that's happened later but um, I know that a lot of those things are also found with Confucius and um, you know there's a, a lot of other teachers in history who, who brought these ideas forward but it's uncanny to me um, how much the uh, I get I guess what 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 really freaks me out 
is that the only prayer that's ever worked for me is make me better. Because if I ask for things to get easier, it never happens. It only gets harder. And um, and now I look at it completely differently. I look at it like, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I believe this entirely, but people say that, you know, you only get what you can stand. You know, God only gives you what you can handle or something to that effect. And um, so you could, if you believe that, you could think of hardship as an honor, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the challenges as, an, as, you know, an opportunity. And that certainly has been the, the case because uh, ever since I learned that prayer of, you know, make me better, because I would look at this, I would be like, you know, I can't speak in front of a crowd. And um, eventually I want to be able to do that. So, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that I pray for is just a ability or, um, you know, to be more forgiving or whatever it takes to, or brave. Um, and I've got those gifts in spades. Like when, when I ask for them, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing because like I said, prior to that, I would ask for things to be easier. Fail. <laughs> never, <laughs> never. It doesn't get easier. It's easier in the sense that I'm more capable, but it's never easier in the circumstances changing. And so, and, and the more I work, the harder it gets. And so right now that just makes me more motivated, you know, and I, I also have an unlimited amount of hope because, because of that spiritual background, I don't believe that I would be here in an unwinnable battle. I don't believe that the earth is going to die. You know, I, I, I absolutely believe that we're here to win. Um, and that journey is, is really where it's at. So when it comes to, uh, say, a moment where I have to be brave or I have to sacrifice and, you know, how far would I go, my chips are all in, you know, because it, to me that's, that's the point of existence. So I have lost my fear in this process, mm -hmm. and I've been put through the ringer over it. So, you know, I, I know you watched one of my videos when I was telling the city that I was going to sue the crap out of him. Because you commented on it. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty powerful. You call it truth sauce. Yeah, it was, it was intense. And, you know, I just. Well, was... right after that, the police harassed me. Yeah. So I don't know if you saw the next video, but it was the police coming that morning telling us that it wasn't really a protest and just thumbing their nose and trying to run all over us. And, you know, it, they, they grabbed all of our signs. They tore up signs. They were just thugs. And that's what happened the day after I, I was like bring it on <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna sue him yeah really bad well good for you I, good you know, for you you are you're saying a call out i've got a call out i need a lawyer if somebody could please look at those videos and see what we've been enduring since day one um i need a lawyer to sue our city thank you <laughs> there you go ping there's your Great. task there's your task for the evening. We we have one of our viewers and chatters who's an absolute force to be reckoned with, and that's just something she'll <laughs> she'll take. And you know, be careful of what you wish for, because uh, yeah. she is corralled. I'm ready. Yeah, she has corralled people over the last couple of days, and the people in uh, Texas and the peop the the DA in Texas and the DA in San Francisco have suffered mightily. To to our yeah. to our benefit because of Ping and crew, uh, you know they just descended upon them. Chat chatters called, faxed, yeah. emailed, and just you know they just couldn't stand the pressure. So um, that's well, uh, our website with our email and everything is visualtv.com. Okay. So please be in touch. Yeah. That'd be awesome. And I do encourage everybody to. Um, get on the YouTube channels and watch the archives. They're very, very powerful. Um, we want to digress there for a minute, but there's a lot to be learned there. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really attracted to them. The stories these, these people, and I, I say these people. I find more and more we're all a lot more alike than we might imagine. Yeah, it's pretty freaky. Like interview with George, uh, that it says something like college, college made me homeless. Uh, if you see that, that one was, you know, the only difference between George and myself, or George and my husband's different times in our lives, is that George didn't have a support network. 
So if you if you don't have to be houseless, if 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 you lose your ability to have any income, some people have a way of you know having that be temporary. Other people don't. And in Portland, the laws are such that once you go to be houseless, you'll never come out. It's, mm -hmm. The likelihood is very small because you'll be harassed and and stripped of everything that you need to get out. And, um, you know, it just ruins your life. So anyway, interview with George, that the thing about college or school, if you if you watch that. The VigilTV.com has three links. It's got this Ustream, it has a, a YouTube archive, and then it has the recommended starting point, which is the highlights, which is where I take a, a couple minutes, you know, or up to up to ten of a particular video and post those. And I'm I'm backlogged. I have put a couple recent videos because they were so important that I wanted them to be in the spot that people look first, which was 99's arrest, um, strictly for being a protester. He was arrested for being a protester. You know, you can see what happened to him. Um, they were setting him up to take our property by the police throwing it on city hall property and saying that the city hall will destroy it and they don't have to write us tickets to get it back, unlike the, unlike the police. It was a... I, I found that out afterwards. Why are they putting all of our stuff on City Hall property? And then they arrested 99. That was a Thursday. And then a few days later, they arrested him again. And um, all of these things will be loaded on those highlights reels. So, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the personal stories of people really do show you that, first of all, there's no one kind of homeless person that's just, uh, you know, a... a, a a myth that there is a type and um, and then there's the oh my god that could have happened to me mm -hmm. the only difference between that person and me is that my family re my friends rescued me from that you know there is a lot of close calls I mean people are being dumped out and chewed up alive by the financial system but most of us have somebody we can turn to in those times you know we certainly have Yep. Well, that was the point you made about the support system. And it's something yeah. that culturally and socially in our country, it, those have dissolved over time. And I'm not talking about the, the federal support systems or you know the faith-based support systems. I'm talking about just the person to person, you know, your, your neighbors or your family, because families are so widespread. Neighbors don't know each other. Right. I'm, I'm working on a, I'm doing a show in our local community and so i've been doing a lot of writing and one of the things i want to talk about is communication and i'm i'm thinking we have more communication tools and more avenues and less communication less understanding is happening yeah. than ever and all that is a support system you know the ability to to talk to your neighbor or talk to your friends and you know say man to keep you afloat through a difficult time. And I'm not talking about just financially, but personally and emotionally and mentally. And that is dissolving daily. So, yeah. you know, if your parents are over in a home that you never go see and you're, you know, you live in an apartment where you're apart from people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're so, we're everybody. There was a comedian or, or somebody who said, you know, Everybody on this block has a leaf blower when we only need it like a couple of times a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we share a, a one leaf blower? Why do we have to every single person buy for themselves, do for themselves, you know, and, right. and nothing is communal. And Occupy was a shared experience. I mean, I, I, I'd like to... Can I talk about that? The shared you, experience you we can had at go on anything you would like. Yes, please. Okay, okay. So Occupy Wall Street, you know, uh, gave us that entire idea that how could it possibly be that in a democratic republic, 99% of the people are suffering unless there's corruption, and then I think Wall Street and everybody else, because of the government suppression of that idea through attacking the camps, realized, wait a second, the government is the one enabling this system, and our representatives are corrupt and paid by the 1%, and they are owned by the 1%. And so 
our power isn't to bring down the banks, you know, directly so much as bring down the system that makes those banks able to exploit. Mm -hmm. Because to me, um, you can't expect anything uh, of a large corporation to be anything but exploitative because they don't have any morals. They're not a person. They're a machine. And when a company um, is treated as – well, it's kind of like this. To give um, – a moral judgment about a company would be like an officer giving a ticket for drunk driving to the car. The people at the wheel are, are getting off scot-free, hiding behind the corporation, and what they're guilty of is saying, get me the money, I don't care how. So just by hiding their, their eyes and letting the system operate without their moral guidance whatsoever, you know, and, and, and feeling like they don't have to be involved, we're allowing them to to let greed run itself and greed is what we do with the WTO and by exploiting people actual slaves to make chocolate actual children dying in a field shackled stolen from other countries you know on the Ivory Coast uh, makes our chocolate then we eat it and we've cut off the responsibility and that's why I have you know, website devoted to that about, you know, taking responsibility for what you consume as a step, you know, to not eat anything but fair trade or organic chocolate just so that you don't uh, kill anybody in the process, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so anyway, th those kinds of things are empowered by people's ability to not have any responsibility and therefore not even know what is happening with their with their companies. And so that 1% are making, you know, that money, I think very few of them have even given it the time of day to question their, their character and what their companies are doing or know what their companies are doing. So I would like to see um, our CEOs be extradited to those countries where they have actually killed people for their profit. I don't see any reason that we should harbor them here. Mm -hmm. They can have them. I would like all of them to just up and go. So anybody, you know, in, in Cargill and ADM who's responsible for those, you know, deaths of children should be held for, for that crime. And they may say, well, I didn't know anything about it. Well, I'm sorry, but you made the money off of not knowing about it, and so you're guilty. So anyway, um, that whole Occupy Wall Street movement also was coupled with a communal experience of being with people who all felt that we cannot allow this, that we will not allow this. And, and through that, we became a family. And Portland stuck as a family. And I think a lot of the reason is we, we did have an office. Um, we do have an office. We do have marches. Mm -hmm. And those marches, marches formed um, people's you know, very uh, amazing amount of solidarity, especially thanks to being beaten by police. And that experience together, um, sadly, but but we also have this occupation or occupancy, as I call it. Um, that that occupancy has been this touchstone, and a lot of us are are bonded in this family, and we we do share and we help one another. And so I believe when when the, you know some of our commissioners are terrified that if we get the placeholders off of the street because that's what they see them as placeholders to keep other people out of Portland who are homeless who want to come here and enjoy the sidewalk I, I it's unbelievable but I believe that if that really became the case where people said you know I don't want to pay six hundred dollars a month out of my thousand that I have for rent um, you know for for my living in rent I would rather just go live outside and be with other people, fine, great. Everybody come here and, and be houseless. That sounds great because I don't think everybody will stay on a street. What will form is, you know, intentional communities and people finding ways to live together and protect one another. Mm -hmm. Just like the street, you know, has people who live together as families, um, but, but housed. You know, people won't stay houseless if you don't, you know, if you don't keep them oppressed and endangered and take their identification so and 
They have, you know, no way to get a job. There's, there's so many things that people don't realize are actually guaranteeing that once you fall, you can't get back up, and mm -hmm. somebody's making a profit off of that. So if we just got rid of that, um, I would say it would be fabulous if people came to Portland to become houseless because they won't stay unhoused. They'll, what they'll do is form communal living. So that, I think that's the evolution that's going to happen, whether whether they want it to or not. We're not going to stay in apartments. We're not going to stay where our grandmother lives in some home we just feed money to and never see her. That's just not – I think people are realizing that's not what they want anymore. Anyway, that's what that's what Occupy shared with me. That, that's what I got out of it. I, I kind of got this big family. Mm -hmm. um, and the sense of community and um, the – I've been involved in a project that – supposition is there's really enough of everything out there in the world what we have is not a supply problem it's a distribution problem because yeah. so much stuff is being hoarded so we came up with this campaign called it's okay to share there's enough for everybody um, and just this past week nice. I heard uh, you know Lee Camp did his bit and he was saying you know there's enough empty Barnes and Noble stores throughout the United States that nobody should ever have to be homeless if you just used oh, those those we buildings. Read. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you know, and it's it's so true. And uh, oh, that's neat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's not it's not that uh, it's not that the companies themselves are being necessarily so greedy or that the government is being greedy. I, I feel like we're all bottom feeders in a way because uh, somehow we've been brainwashed into this belief that I would rather you not have it if I like. Let's say we just uh, we decided that everybody who has gone to college so far will pay their loans off, and everybody who has houses so far will pay their mortgages off. And in that way, we'll have a better economy because people will be stable and educated, and uh, we'll just see, you know, how it goes. Um, Americans would tear each other up because a person would naturally say, "Well, I would have gone to, gone to college if I'd known this isn't fair." Right. But when it comes to the microscopic, where you say, "Well, let's let these people uh, live in a park in a tent at night." They're not bothering anyone, and we'll we'll have the police, you know, check the area, make sure it's safe, and we'll keep it safe. Um, and uh, you know, let let's put everything on a sliding scale, you know, resources. And the the problem is, is that anything that they give to one person, instead of saying, hey, we could all have that, but let's start with the most in need. People say immediately, "That's not fair. I didn't get mine, so therefore you can't have it either." Right. And so, to me, that is the reason why people are on the street is this unfortunate, you know, moral decay that we're in, where we would rather somebody suffer than get something that we don't get. Right. It's horrible. Well, we we have become a culture of competition instead of cooperation, and every every message we get from every arena is you know conditioning us to compete not cooperate um and it's a societal ill and you know it des yeah. describes a lot so um any closing thoughts yeah, you'd like i was to... there a year ago yeah you know i mean i was there a year ago my my mentality has only changed because of this movement and maybe a little bit prior from my own work in the non-gmo but but really, I mean, I'm not saying I'm above that mentality. I'm saying that it's a real shame that that defines our United States right now. Yeah, that it defines our culture and it defines us as a people of just being a greedy, competitive people. Um, and, and the people who hate houseless people the most are the people who are one step from it. Right. Because they're treading water and they've been told that if they do that, if they work hard, um, they will succeed, and therefore they deserve it. And so, therefore, everybody who has not made it, uh, the people who have been victimized for various things, um, they must all be lazy. They must all be taking advantage. Um, so, so the people who are driving by with the air horn to wake people up, 
or um, the, the street cleaners who intentionally spray people with water on their shift, um, those people are the ones who are two paychecks away. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and that is, I've heard that's what the, uh, what is it, that's the middle, the, 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 the rich uh, use the poor to keep the middle class In scared into yeah. working. Right. You know, <laughs> to never stop working. Well, the the hatred that it has sprung to feel like your success means that you're entitled and your failure means that you are, you know, lazy or, or whatever. It, it is really um, it, that our hate is coming from the working and lower struggling class, you know. So and and we have a challenge of taking those people in when they fall uh, without, you know, feeling um, anger toward them and mm -hmm. just forgive it. But that's that's what more and more people are, are having happen. They land here and then they feel sorry for their judgment, mm -hmm. you know. It, it's And I've seen those stories, you know. I, I believe that there's a hint of that in some people's you know, testimony to how they, they got here, that they never thought it could happen to them, that they were among those who didn't, you know, didn't feel like houseless people, you know, should be there unless there was something wrong that they have done. Right. You know, and then, then it happens to them. Yep. And, and you know, and the cycle continues. So... <laughs> Um, Not for long. We're, we're I, I don't know. I feel like we're on the cusp of something. Um, the, there's a chance that we could really win some hearts and minds with this project. I don't know where it's going to go, and I know that there are projects of, of different kinds that are all, also have potential of winning the local battles that can change that mindset from powerlessness away to power. And, and ours definitely, I can see something like um, a compilation of these stories put into a documentary mm -hmm. or, you know, if somebody were to work with us. We're, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. You had asked about the, the other people from, from Vigil TV and what we're, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to say what happened was uh, I got that mobile hotspot and realized that I could share, you know, this, and um, we got a camera for 99 um, from his friend, found somebody, and she passed this hotspot back and forth. And uh, then um, we were sitting around. There was another guy who uh, had been doing Ustream, and so he joined in Vigil TV and would go on in that um, website. And, and then um, we had a couple of other people who had never done anything like it. Um, you know, 99 had not done anything like it, so it's pretty amazing how much of a personality he is. But um, the uh, the other folks, one of them had never owned a color TV. Mm -hmm. it was, he'd been out for like 30 years um, and uh, never had a CD player. And you'll hear him. It's called uh, Reporter Joe is the segment. And it's hilarious because, I mean, he's very funny, and he's really good, and he's a poet. Um, so, yeah, Joe goes out, we all tuck him up like he's, you know, going to his first day of school as a little kid. Or like, okay, Joe, go go out into the field, and he walks around and, you know, talks to the viewers, and it, it's really neat to see uh, the birth of a streamer. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we had, um, let's see, so Joe, Josh, Dan, 99, myself, and then the sixth member that I referred to in the Oregon the Oregonian article, it's a amalgamation because we have people that come in and out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, we're looking for one of our best guys. We don't know where he went, <laughs> so <laughs> he'll be back. Yeah. But um, you know, so so we have a, a couple of people that fit that. One of them has a master's degree in um, uh, conflict resolution, and he's been giving us uh, classes on de-escalation. Excellent. Really cool. Yeah, I'm, he's a he's a funny guy. If you see Jiro, uh, he will do role playing with with people who he's interviewing. 
it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. I love a good teach-in, you know, and that just that that's the thing about this is people bring different skills to the table, and they meet and they connect. And we interviewed a young woman months ago, a Keeney free child, and she said something that is burned into my brain is connect, communicate, and convey. So everybody shows up with their skill set, and they make a connection. And then they can be, begin communicating, and then they can convey information broadly and skill share and info share, and everybody benefits. Everybody contributes, and everybody benefits. So it sounds exactly like what you guys got going on. And it's, it's, it, it's it, just having that little flame there has really brought us together because there's a purpose, uh, but it's also you know not just the end goal, it's also the process and what we're doing to try to make it happen and it's given people an opportunity um, to to rise up you know and take their turn at hit, hitting it out of the park um, there's a guy named Jimmy who gives a speech at City Hall and it, it's wonderful but he also in addition to giving a speech on the march he had just been inside City Hall presenting a diorama to try to show them Oh God, I'm gonna laugh. He had a diorama where it had camping, and then on one side it had people. And he's like, and this is called living on the street. <laughs> and I know you might be confused because there's a sleeping bag and a tree, but there's also this street. <laughs> and and then he's like, and this is demonstration where we're sleeping out in front of City Hall. And he points to his model and he says, I apologize for how shabby City Hall is. <laughs> it was so funny. He did this. I recorded it. Um, you can also like watch it from the city hall camera. And I guess they followed him around the room because they keep telling him to sit down. But he gets up and he like shows people this diorama. That's outstanding. And it's all this Art and activism. I it's, love it. It's fantastic. Oh, it was. It's so funny. We have a lot on that diorama, but Jimmy rocks the diorama is a segment that you want to see. It's so funny. Oh my god. Oh god. Uh, that was so funny. Well, I'm sure you could be confused because there's a sleeping bag, but this is called living on the street. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, that that speaks to our whole dilemma about the camping ban. How disgusting it is that they're calling it camping. Right. It's just. It's tragic to take away somebody's sleeping bag, to take away their ability to sleep, to take away their ability to have warmth. It's just, it's really, you know, to throw them in jail for it. I mean, really. And then to, to, to instead of throwing them in jail, you might give them community service, whether you're free labor. And, uh, yeah, this has got to end. I don't understand um, why when people walk by, and they see people who are houseless. Some of them are nesters. We've got a problem with nesters sometimes. Nesters come in, they have their dirty blankets, they just leave them there. You know, they, they don't care. And I understand why they don't care. Because I had an experience of that walking in somebody's shoes, and it was, it was freaky. And um, I don't know if there's time, but I, I can tell you what, what happened to me. This is the most traumatic thing that happened to me at the vigil, I can tell you, but... Anyway, the, the the folks just, you know, they don't care. They don't care about other people necessarily. They're, um, you know, they're, they're messy and they're disorganized. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, you know, actually disorganized schizophrenia. Um, but, uh, you know, some people are just, they don't have skills of packing their stuff up. They don't have equipment that folds down. You know, some people look like they're, they're amazing lifer backpackers. You know, they have... A, a jet sterno, whatever it is, you know, right. that's a hundred bucks. But but other people have this nasty, thick comforter they're dragging around like Linus, and it's really really sad. And those people are getting judged by those who walk by, and that leads to that mentality of saying that we're not a demonstration. But what those folks are are refugees, because all we've provided at that demonstration that would attract them. Is the fact that police are not waking them up and making them move at all hours of the night, and that there are people on the lookout so that they're not getting raped or robbed. So that is literally all we have to offer 
and we cannot keep people away if we wanted to. And sometimes we've extended that with open arms, and it's collapsed inward because we had more need than ability. Right. And uh, so I've been making a call out to the community. I did this flyer, and I, I, I asked. I was like, let's just go up and down. Sit, you know, let's go up and down Fourth Avenue, in front of the jail in front of the Portland building, in front of City Hall, um, all these public spaces, the parks that we were at, you know, when, when we had people off the street, you know, and uh, let, let's be here outside, but instead of chasing people off, let's welcome everybody into the light and then bring whatever we need of resources there because that's where they are, you know. They're, they're not going to go stand in line at a, a single building to get all of their services and find out that you know they needed five dollars they didn't know they needed or whatever is happening it's a real my friend calls it homeless survivor mm -hmm. there's a big competition for services and there's a lot of complicated hassles that people who have homes can't go through but imagine if you can't you know ride a bus even right, right. you know or you know you just don't have what is needed to be together so anyway, it would be really nice if we could bring in, you know, services of these organizations that that could give people a hand up and put them in a safety position where they could actually just save up money for rent because some of them have checks that come in every month, but they just they can't afford rent. Um, interview with John, is he's a vet, he's disabled, he's been waiting for eight months on the street to get to get housing. Um, because his VA, you know, it's not enough. So, um, you know, being full, you know, nearly fully disabled and having, you know, served in a war, and I, it's really hard to believe that he can't have any apartment anywhere in Portland. So, anyway, if we were to if we were to just give people a hand up by making these uh, areas, you know, right on the sidewalk where people could go to, like a job fair. I mean, we, we, we have it periodically, like once a year there's a there's something um, where they do give out, like, boots and, you know, clothes and so forth. But this would be, you know, everything you need to get off the street. Somebody is there providing it, but uh, we could do that. We, we made some carts that had, uh, you know, we had blanket storage and we were experimenting with that. Um, you know, we, we did it at the occupancy. We, we actually, you know, provided those, you know, mental health services and, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of, like, naturopath type stuff that helped people quite a bit. Um, anyway, it was, you know, and fed 1,500 meals a day, you know, by just bringing the community in through donations of mm -hmm. food that the, that the company didn't need. It was, you know, day-old bread and stuff, so, or people's garden vegetables. Anyway, it's perfectly doable. We could actually make the 2,500 people in Portland safe and potentially to get out of, out of their situation, you know, with, with some help, but themselves. Mm -hmm. And instead, we have what we have now is, is resistance to that, you know, and, and it's coming from the public who walks by and feels compelled to you know, judge other people because they don't look pretty, you know, because they have their stuff with them. And that that's a major battle is people have this burden of wearing everything that they own, having to take it everywhere and not lose it or have it get wet, and they can't set it down. They're not allowed to set it down anywhere. And they can't go inside a place because, you know, they can't pass for a customer because they, they look poor. Um, so they, they, they can't go into even to trial without finding somebody to take their backpack. And right now, the fact that the police are trying to say you have to stand there, or keep walking, there's nowhere you can be. Um, the stress on people of being illegal in everything that they do is really sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's wearing on people. And, and one of the solutions that our group came up with was that the city could provide lockers. It's so obvious. I mean, it's so easy. Even on a sliding scale where you could have everybody in the city get a locker if they want. If you have money, you have to pay. 
that they could put lockers in Portland. They they totally could do that. I mean, some somebody's going to immediately jump to the, well, that won't work because X, Y, Z. But, you know, that's why we have think tanks, and somebody could actually solve that problem if they were committed. Um, and that would do, right there, that would do a tremendous amount of good for the people who are living out there. You tell them that idea, and they go off into this fantasy land in their mind. You watch them daydreaming about what it would be like to have a place for their backpack. And it's really sad mm -hmm. to see that. Right. That's the big fantasy, you know. Anyway, I'm, I'm very angry at our city for not... I mean, we can come up with stuff in 10 minutes that they have failed to do for 20, 30 years. Right, So, and it's not a lack of resources. It's a lack of will on the part of the city government. Yeah. Or, or, and because they're making money, right? Dollar, dollar, yeah. they're making a lot of money. These politicians uh, are so crooked. I want to um, wind this up with a final question that it may be rhetorical, but it's worth asking. What would success of the vigil look like? Um, well, first of all, the, the community on our side. What we're trying to do is open hearts and minds and educate, you know, um, for compassion. And, uh, and so if people walk by and instead of seeing somebody who's messy, is seeing somebody who has a burden that, that they could help. Um, or instead of seeing demonstrators as a nuisance, they saw them as the saviors, you know, which, which we all are. Um, that, is, to me, is the success, because if we had that, we could do anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's, why, um, that's why I'm doing the Vigil TV, is because I think that that is one way to open up people's hearts, is to educate them and show them that not only the travesty, but you know, the proximity to someone they love, you know, this situation. So anyway, yeah, I think that that would be success, for sure. Um, I think, and it's a it's a success on a grand scale if we could reach that point because it doesn't just solve the houselessness problem. It it empowers right. people and they realize, oh, we we solve this problem, we can solve any problem, and right. that's that's and this where is we a need civil to be. rights movement. Like like I said, it's led by the poor, the poorest, but because the ninety nine percent are the minority of power. I think we have to look at this as a civil rights movement that's unprecedented in, in the number of people who are being oppressed. You know, it, it's not something we think of when we think of minority. We think of numbers of people. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the masses are the ones being exploited. So if the most oppressed are the ones who garner, you know, that support from the community and we start working on these issues their most extreme, then we will be working on the issues all the way up through, you know, for everyone, you know, including the children of the 1% who have to inherit this world, right. you know, so it's the 100% that we're working for, <laughs> that was... definitely, but the, the motivated people of a civil rights movement are the most oppressed, and then they get support, and that's, you know, we're a support system, but it's also our, our family, so... Yep. Yep. I think that was a great way to wind up. It, you you just said that we're working for the hundred percent. That is is at its base, <laughs> it's true. So, I want to thank you so much for spending your evening with us. It, your your experience has been um, very inspiring, and the stories you relay you. are just um, incredible. And and I want to thank you for the the good work i mean it's been a Thank joy you. to um to research this and to be able to talk with you and i uh, find it very compelling and very inspiring and i want to give a you just to the chatters and viewers i just want to say um this is a really good example of what we're talking about when we speak of local solutions to global problems i mean houselessness homelessness is is worldwide for all the same reasons and we have Mary here as an example with the other people that are working with Vigil TV that took it upon themselves 
you know, occupied Portland rallied around and they're making a local difference day by day and it's extremely hard work and extremely challenging but it could not be more important so my hat's off to you guys um i well, really can appreciate I make it. A quick sure plug yeah something before we go yeah please do um so there's vigil tv we support the vigil itself which is a larger group of people and that's supported by occupy portland and a lot of uh, outside community organizations as well and i um we have a, a donation list of physical items including gift cards if you're not around um, and what they're used for and that that we could really use some help because winter is coming so tarps are going to save lives and that's what we did last year and we're going to do it again um, it's no fun to be a burrito on a sidewalk but it is better than having a, a little you know basket or something to live in in a dangerous part of town so we are taking you know that on and so if you'd like to help that's visualtv.com I yep. really appreciate that. And we've been putting up all your links as we've been speaking, and we also have oh. them all, all collected on the pad so that um, if you guys will check out the pad link that uh, clearly had put up, all that information for the websites and the donation links are there, and you will be able to find all the information about where to send what, et cetera, and contact info for, for the projects and for Mary. So... Um, help out I I can I have to say it's uh, you know it's a valuable and worthwhile thing to do to try to, to help this this crew out so thank you for your your spending your evening with us and I want to give you, a, yeah I want to say thanks and our rise thank yeah, you rise for yeah, introducing rise us. has been here the whole time and rise is a good friend of ours too uh, so that's great and yeah. Ernie has been like the guest facilitator tonight, so it's so good to have him joining us and oh, helping Ernie. out with links and donates. <laughs> so thank you so I'm much. I'm waving to the wall. <laughs> and I want to thank oh, clearly. We just had our second anniversary. Oh, congratulations! Second anniversary. I want to thank clearly <laughs> and Zena for doing such a good job on the mod tonight. It was a, uh, you know, pretty pretty busy night so i thank you and uh i'm gonna sign off of the stream now and um then i'll talk to mary offline but i hope everybody has a good evening tomorrow night i'll be streaming a live show out of Asheville. um that's going to start somewhere around seven and then sunday afternoon a matinee show out of Asheville with the firestorm collective i'm going to interview the collective members on how to build a you know they've been doing this successful community center anarchist bookstore coffee shop thing for five five years or so um right so on. i think it's a great uh, local experience so that'll be four o'clock on sunday afternoon so thank you opn thank you occupy world news now thank you gr resist all you guys it's good to see you and uh we'll be back with more keep a check on our website o-p-n.org if you haven't joined join it and you'll get email updates on when we have shows coming up thank you guys for participating tonight mm -hmm.